I want first of all I want to welcome all of you. Welcome all of you, and hope that you will, at the end of this session, be more prepared to uh, deal with uh, preparation and prevention of hazards and, and emergencies. But also, we like we. I want to tell you how important it was for us, the Health Advisory Committee and the Emergency Preparedness Advisory Committee, HAC and EPAC, we call ourselves, to work together on mutual con interest and concerns for the health and well-being of the leisure world community. And so I will welcome you this afternoon and I hope that uh, in our introductions you will be able to see why we have two segments of our program. Today part of the program will be you will hear, you will hear from experts, individuals that serve our communities and serve us. But also the second part you will divide, we will have an opportunity to talk to each other, to ask questions of each other, uh, and, and to have your questions answered, and to share in a community spirit. So this, that our, 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 uh, our experts will stay with us today. They will stay with us to answer questions. I'm going to ask you, because of the timing, and we have so much planned, for you to hold your questions until the second part. So we will go, we'll start with introductions by the chair of, the, of our committee, the Emergency Preparedness Advisory Committee, Duke Deshawn. Duke. First off, let me say thanks to all of you for attending this program today. Something about the program I'd like to share with you. You won't find this program anywhere else but in Leisure World. The committees, the Health Committee and the EPAC Committee got together and decided we need to have something that would provide additional information to all of you regarding not only your health, but your emergency preparedness. So it was really a great thing to do, and we appreciate your attendance here. I would like my committee to stand. I was wanting them to introduce themselves, but if they would just stand up there, you can see members of the EPAC committee here. And then if I can have the representatives from the, uh, advisor, the health advisory committee that are helping us, please stand. I want you to give them all a hand because they have worked out very hard to get this program. So without further ado, I'll let the program continue and thank you for coming. as you will see in your in your bio sketches and I want to ask you to take a look at your bio sketches because we have decided today that we wouldn't uh, use uh, lengthy descri descriptions but you would uh, they have something that you could take on to see the expertise that we have brought you today and uh, we just have, we have to thank Emily for staying up last night to be sure that they were cut down so you could get so you would have something to take with you. So, uh, uh, just I want to say something about uh, Candace. She's a very unusual person. And you will see that she's a certified preparedness, health, and safety instructor, a disaster training instructor, and a community preparedness education presenter. So she wears a number of hats, and we're so happy to have her here today. And Candace, I'm turning the podium over to you. So happy to be back here again. This is my third year coming back, right? How many of you have been in my presentations before? So all of you who are raising your hand, you have an emergency preparedness kit, right? Uh-huh. Okay, so I'm back. And they told me they're going to keep bringing me back every year until everyone has a kit, okay? So <laughs> get used to me. So we're going to talk about preparedness, and um, I had a friend here who was helping me with logistics. This is a little blurry, 
And when he comes back in, we can just ask him to make it a little bit clearer. I thought it was me at first because I don't have my glasses on, but does it look blurry? Just a little bit? Just a little bit. Use the mic. Use the mic? Yes. I thought you could hear me. Okay. So that's good because the God is videotaping me. He's happy because I'm going to stand right here by the mic now. So he had to chase me last year. So, okay. So we're going to talk about preparedness. And you all know I like to bring my show and share, right? So when we talk about preparedness, we're talking about not only just having an emergency first aid kit just with a couple of band-aids and that good stuff in there, but we're talking about having a kit if you have to leave in a hurry. If something happens and you must leave your home, what are you going to grab? Most people don't grab anything because in this area, in our national capital region, we respond mostly to fires, okay? And you really don't have a lot to grab when you're trying to get out in less than two minutes, right? So why prepare? The reason why we say get a kit, be prepared, is because in the national capital region, just from the first of April, excuse me, the first of January this year, and today, the 11th of April, how many responses do you think we had just here in Montgomery County alone? You see the news every night, you see fires, you see multifamily fire apartment buildings. Have you seen any in the news since the 1st of January? Yes, what have you seen? Fires. Fires? What about Poots Hill? Remember last year, Poots Hill? Yeah. Yeah. About 500 units in that building was displaced, 500 families. Families could be one person to up to five people in those units. How about on Montrose Court? Does that sound familiar to you? What about out there in Olney? O-L-N-E-Y, Olney. -E Olney. Oh, yeah. Yes, there were a lot of fires going on. And so when people have to be displaced um, quickly, they usually don't have their emergency kit, okay? It's not too many fires where I showed up and someone said, I had my emergency kit. So that's why we want to talk to you about that today. And I'll give you something that just happened recently. What about on March 2nd when we had that really heavy windstorm? Do you remember that? In Suitland, Maryland? We had nine apartment buildings, nine, that was shut down. Everyone in those apartment buildings had to leave immediately. They were not structurally sound. All the wind that was blowing and some of them were falling apart. And because it was such an awful night with the weather, they couldn't really do a damage asse assessment. And so they said, you know what, everyone has to leave. And that next day, the next actually 72 hours, they were checking out the building. End of the story, we had a shelter, no, shelter open for almost 12 days because people were displaced. 150 families were able to return to their units, and there were 92 families that could not return to their units for at least 90 days or more. Now remember, these folks left on a cold and windy night. It was probably about 9 o'clock that night. They left with the clothes they had on. How many of them grabbed an emergency kit? They probably didn't, right? But they haven't had my presentation either. <laughs> so I want to talk to you about what goes in the kit. And I will have you know that everything that you see on the table, this is in one of my emergency kits. When we talk about a kit, we're talking about either, you know, you see this nice little red bag up here. I have the large suitcase because I have a family, okay? I have a family, so I have a little bit more stuff in that suitcase. Now that's not my only emergency kit because I'm all over the place. I'm always driving in my car, right? So I have another emergency kit. You see the backpack and the chair. But not only that, my third one is on the floor. And the reason why it's on the floor is because that incident that happened in Suitland, Maryland, when I showed up, I didn't know they were gonna be displaced for you know 10, 10 to 12 days but I knew it would probably be something. So I always carry that particular bag in my vehicle because it has a little bit more stuff because I know that once I get there and we say shelter, I'm gonna be there with that population until it's over. When they go home, that's when I go home, right? So you don't have to have one emergency kit and we highly recommend that you have more than one because if you're traveling, if you uh, have a workplace, whatever the case may be, it's okay to have more than one kit. We want that kit to be durable waterproof. Now if you notice one of those, the large one is on wheels. Now here's the thing, I've heard people say they put their emergency items in a foot locker. Can you carry the foot locker when it's time to get out? <laughs> so if you know you can't carry it, then that's probably not what you want to put your emergency. I'm talking emergency you have to leave. I'm not talking about shelter in place. When you have to leave in an emergency, 
Whatever you can carry, you need, to, you need to make sure it's something that you can carry and don't wait for someone to come and get it for you. Now, where should we have this emergency kit? Those of you who already have an emergency kit, where do you store yours? By the front door. By the front door. Yes, Emily, by the front door. And why by the front door? Anyone? So you can just grab it because I've heard people say I have it in my basement. I have it in the storage closet, it's in my bedroom, somewhere. So you want to make sure it's, some, it's where you will most likely exit your home. If it's the front door, fine. If it's the back door, that's okay too. And I like to share with people that I have that big one sitting in the foyer or foyer or whatever you want to call it. It's in my house sitting by the front door. And one day I was running late and I told my, I called my 18 year old because I had rushed out of the house and I told my 18-year-old son, okay? I said, Jay, I forgot my bag. Oh no, I'm coming back, I'm coming back to get it. And guess what he was running out the house with? The emergency kit. I was talking about my purse. It was on the counter in the kitchen. But this is how I have my, my two teenagers trained that the emergency bag is by the front door. So I said, no son, good job, but I need my purse, it's on the kitchen counter. So you want to make sure you have your emergency kit where you can grab it quickly. And you know if your emergency exit is on your patio, the back door, fine. Put your bag by the back door, but make sure it's something that becomes second nature while you're grabbing in an emergency. So let's talk about the other six categories. Food. How many of you um, eat when you're sad? <laughs> eat when you're glad? <laughs> sad, glad? celebrating, I eat anytime, you know, I have no problems with eating. So, you know, when, when I'm a little stressed, food, you know, works wonders for me. I feel a little bit better with that chocolate. So the reason why I'm saying this is that when you're in an emergency, you want to have an emergency supply of food, not just because your nerves are bad, but because you need that emergency supply. You don't know what's going to happen. Now, I'm not, I'm not talking about the one that you shelter in place and you have all the canned goods and all that stuff. I'm talking about an emergency kit. Now inside the bag that I say I carry around in my vehicle, I have snacks. And the good news is I have good snacks. What's this? It's tuna. In a little vacuum pack, little pack. I don't need anything. I can literally eat it from the bag. It'll be a little messy, but you know, you don't need anything for this, right? What about granola bars? What about oatmeal? What do I need for oatmeal? water that's it right so I'm not talking about candy and junk food and all that I'm talking about stuff that has protein in it stuff that I wouldn't mind eating in an emergency right now I can tell you people ask all the time about emergency kits what type of food how many of you all remember this anyone know what this is you hear it this is emergency rations you can eat this by the way each bar has about um, 400 calories. It says eat one bar every six hours per person. So let me share this with you. I used to be in the military, right? And uh, we had MREs. And MREs are pretty good nowadays. But when I see on here where it says every one bar every six hours per person, it makes me a little nervous. And I'll tell you why. MREs for soldiers is designed to keep them regular too, right? So at one bar every six hours is a giveaway here. I don't know if I want this, but I will tell you, you can buy these emergency food rations, but make sure you know what they taste like. Because during an emergency would be the wrong time to figure out this tastes like cardboard or something, right? Or it's going to have you run into a bathroom where you probably don't have running water or you're in a shelter, right? So when you pick out your emergency food rations, make sure you taste them. Make sure you enjoy them. But not only that, if it's multiple people in your family, get something for everyone. Everyone will enjoy. And if you have little grandchildren with you or children that you watch, make sure you just don't have candy and fruit roll-ups and all that sugar. Make sure you don't have candy, roll-ups, and all that sugar, because they'll be bouncing off the walls, right? So be careful with that, but we want to make sure you have it. Let's talk about the water. Does water expire? Yes. Does it? Yes. Does the water expire, or does the container it's in expire? Is the container that it's in can expire. 
So those of you who have stacks of water in your home, make sure you're rotating that water. It's very important. It's not the water, but it's the container that it's in. So everyone recommends that you have at least 72 hours, excuse me, 72, for every 72 hours of water, three days, one gallon per person. How many of you drink one gallon of water a day now? You'd be amazed how much you drink when you know there's a limited supply. All of a sudden you're really thirsty <laughs> when the water is not working or you don't have access. But one gallon a day per person is the recommendation. That's a lot of water, right? So that water that you're keeping in your home because you want to be prepared, make sure you're rotating it. The water that has expired, you don't necessarily have to get rid of it. Maybe you'll need that to flush your toilets if something was to happen at home and the water was shut off. Maybe you need that to wash dishes or wash clothes. So you don't have to get rid of the water, but just know that you need to have at least, at least a gallon per person for 72 hours. Okay? Let's talk about first aid kits. I love first aid kits, okay? So on the table, I have different sizes of first aid kits. So one, I have a lot of different sizes because... Uh, being in the Red Cross, everyone thinks you're a doctor or a nurse. At least the kids and the teenagers do, right? I'm not a doctor and I'm not a nurse. So when I say I don't have a Band-Aid or something, they say, really, Red Cross? You don't have a Band-Aid? Really? So I have a lot of kids. The reason why I'm saying this is if you already know that there are certain, um, certain medications you use, if you can't sleep, if you have a cold, if you have a runny nose, you have a cut or a burn, make your own first aid kit because, you know, buying these nice, big, pretty kits and people always ask me, where can I buy one? We can sell you one on redcross.org store, but you don't need a kit with a scalpel, you know what I mean? You don't need all that extra stuff unless you're a doctor and you know how to use all that stuff in your kit. Keep it simple. Put what you know that you would usually use. Why? You don't want to get one of these really nice big first aid kits. You don't know how you're going to react to the medications that are in there, the over-the-counter drugs. You don't want to be surprised in an emergency, right? So do what works best for you and those folks in your home. Let's talk about clothing and bedding. How many of you have an emergency kit? Okay, so those of you who have an emergency kit, do you have clothes in your emergency kit? Absolutely, yes. I see two heads shaking, yes. So you want to have clothes because remember what I said about that storm on the 2nd of March? They left their home as is. You know how when you're at home and you're not expecting company and you're not going anywhere? That's the type of as is I'm talking about, right? Not necessarily matching, not necessarily prepared for the weather. So you want to have something in your emergency kit, something that matches, by the way, maybe a sweatshirt, sweatpants, a pair of shoes. And I say this because I did this presentation at a business in D.C., a government agency, and, you know, I did it a little bit different. I said I wanted everyone to bring their emergency kits in because I wanted to see if they really had an emergency kit, and I wanted to see what was in it. So I asked one gentleman to take one lady to take out her clothes and she took out her clothes and she had a mismatched shirt and pants and nothing matched and I said really and she said well I didn't want to put my good clothes in there <laughs> <laughs> so not only will you be displaced in emergency you'll look like you're displaced in emergency <laughs> so I'm just saying put something that you wouldn't mind walking around in the public in okay so make sure it matches make sure it's appropriate for the weather you don't want to put a pair of shorts or a, a t-shirt in there for perhaps um, the, sub, the winter time. You want to make sure that you have stuff that's part of, the, part of what's going on with the weather. Now I would say this, people always ask, well, you know, you got a lot of stuff here and now you're telling me I need to have clothes as well. So if you're going to have those clothes, how many of you have seen these? These are uh, vacuum packed bags. Okay, so I love these bags. I'm from Florida, folks. So when I got here, I was like, are you telling me I have to have winter clothes? I got to have summer clothes. I got to have fall clothes. I cannot believe how many times you got to change clothes here, right? So I said, where do I put all these blankets and all that? So I was introduced to these vacuum pack bags. I mean, they are your friend. You put the stuff in the bags. 
you hook it up to your vacuum cleaner, you suck all the air out of it, and it is amazing how quickly it shrinks down. So these vacuum bag bags, this is a big one. This one's like for quilts or blankets, and you can put pillows in here, and it is amazing. And the best thing about this is, you can put a little dryer sheet inside the bag with your clothes, or with your pillows and linen and that type of stuff, and it shrinks down and it smells just as fresh, it automatically puts back out again. So, if you're thinking about where am I going to put all this stuff, you can use those vacuum pack bags. Now when I talk about those clothing and bedding, I'm also talking about if you have a special blanket, if you're someone that prefers a pillow, you want to consider packing that as well. If you go to a Red Cross shelter, we'll give you a blanket. It'll look just like the one that's here on the table. We don't have pillows, but we'll give you two blankets. Will that be enough for you? if you had to go in an emergency? If you say no, I think I would like something a little bit more comfortable, that's what you want to consider putting in your backpack. This is a blanket that I carry around and the one that I have in my car, because I like fleece, and this feels really nice and it rolls up really nice. I have that in my car. I tell people all the time when I came here to the National Capital Region, I came here doing Snowmageddon. You all remember that? And they were leaving the cars on BWI on the Beltway? And I was watching the news, and I was telling my husband, okay, they're leaving their cars on a major highway. Why are we here again? Why am I here? But when I saw that, and now, knowing about emergency preparedness kits, how many people do you think were stuck on the side of the road and they had an emergency kit in their car? How many of those? I often wonder, and the reason why I say that is because although I like this blanket, this is a warming blanket. We have all different types of blankets, and I'm going to pass this around so you can see a little bit closer. These little emergency blankets, you can have these in your car or an emergency kit, and it's like a thermal blanket. It will keep you warm. Now, last year when I was here, I had someone who said, um, oh, I don't know if that'll keep me warm. So I opened up one of the, uh, the foil blankets to let her try it. Is she here by any chance? I wish she could give a testimony, but um, <laughs> I'm going to pass these around because I want you to take a look at these uh, blankets, and you can just pass them in back of you because there are several different options. Here I am. There are several different options, and these uh, thermal blankets, they can fit right inside your backpack. They can fit inside um, your purse if that's where you want to put it, but there's options here. And especially if you're someone who's cold nature, you're always cold no matter what, no matter what day of the week it is. Where did my video go? There we go. Okay, so you can have those on your person at any given time, and they're wonderful. I love them. The good thing is I'm a family of four. Four of those takes up no room inside my emergency kit. Very little room at all. Let's talk about tools and emergency supplies. How many of you know what the orange thingy is up there? Do you even know what that is? What's that? I think the orange thingy is to cut the seatbelt and break the window. Absolutely, that's exactly what it is. It's to cut your seatbelt or to break a window. Oh, and I'm talking about a uh, car window, window shield. These are excellent. Now, this is the way you can purchase this. This is about $7, okay? And it has this little mount because some people mount it in their car where they can have quick access to it. How many of you have ever had to cut a seat belt? I've never had to cut one either, but those things last a long time, right? How long have you had your car? Some of you had cars for 20 something years or even for five years. How many of you had to ha have had to cut a seat belt? So that's what this end is for, for cutting a seat belt. This end is for breaking the window shield or a window. All it takes is a tap. Now I will say this, all it takes is a tap. Trust me on this, okay? Because I've had presentations where I have people say, Candace, it really works. I was just showing my husband and I hit the slide glass door and the whole thing shattered. Oh so trust me when I tell you it works, okay? Try it on something else, but this thing works. And it's good to have in your emergency <laughs> kit, especially in your car, because you never know when you'll need it, right? Now pass this around as well. So when, we, when we're talking about those emergency kits, how many of you seen that little Gerber up there, right? Or the Swiss knife or whatever you want to call it. 
How many of you have one of these things? Thank you, my front row, yay. So on this, this has a little bit of everything. Now I will tell you, I don't know what all this stuff is used for. I have no idea. I just know I'm ready if something should happen, right? So there's a lot going on here. And so I have um, a few of my, my colleagues who say, oh yeah, I have one of those. And then I have to show them my little gadget. Well, do you have one of these? This one has a little hammer on the end of it. And there's a little ax on the front of it. Now, what would I need it for? I have no idea. It's in my emergency kit. So this also is like a Gerber product because here on the side, you have more tools on it. And I'm saying this is because we don't know when emergency is going to happen. We don't know what we need. These little gadgets will go in an emergency first aid kit, or excuse me, emergency kit, my go bag, whatever you want to call it, just things to consider. Now, keep in mind, all of our kits won't look the same. You'll say, you know, you probably look at this and say, I really don't need that. Don't put it in your kit. Put what works for you inside your kit. Let's talk about flashlights and weather radios and all that good stuff. So when we talk about the first aid kit, who knows what this is? Oh, excuse me, the emergency kit. What is this? Duct tape. Duct tape. What is this? Painters tape, electric tape, I got them all up here. And the reason why I ask is because what can you do with duct tape? <laughs> like what? Like what can you use this for? Anyone? This is interactive. Everything. Everything. Well, you know, I was asking because look at all the things you can use them for. Repair booze, repair your water bottle, make a clothesline, reseal packages of food, wrap a sprained ankle, repair clothing, mend a spleen, make a crutch, right? A lot of different things you can use it for. And if my husband was here, he'll give you 50 right off the top of his head. He is not mechanically inclined, okay? Every time I say fix something, it's bringing out the duct, duct tape. So we have a rule in my house. He can only use duct tape it's an, if it's an emergency. This goes in his emergency kit, and that's it, nothing else. So duct tape can be used for a variety of things. So you want to make sure you have some type of tape. You can't go wrong with having that inside your kit. Now, what about this red thing at the top? What is that? The red one. What was that? Yes, it's a weather radio. Weather radio. How many of you have a weather radio? Yes, yes, yes. A weather radio is your friend. Why? Because there's so many things that you can do with this weather radio. This one is actually, actually goes in my family kit. On the back of this, I'll start with the best features. What is this on the back? It's a port to charge your phone. Charge your phone. Now the good thing about this, this is the way I get a charge. All I have to do is crank this, okay? I can crank this to charge this radio. I can keep it in, keep it near sunlight, light. It'll stay charged. Or I can even plug it into the wall. Or I can even put batteries in here if I don't want to crank it. Now, why is this important? When the power goes out and you want to hear what's going on, this weather radio picks up every station, right? And during an emergency, I like to hear the facts, especially when there's no power and I can't watch television because I want to get as close to the truth as possible. I don't want my next door neighbor telling me what's going on. You know what I mean? So this weather radio is something that you should have. Everyone should have one of these. What is this on the end? It's an antenna. <coughs> Too easy, right? Well, I tell you, we go into the schools with the little children, and I pull this out. Third graders. What's this? What do you think they say? It's a sword. It's a saber. <laughs> they have no idea what this is because they don't have antennas on anything nowadays. But this has an antenna, and most weather radios will come with an antenna. Also on here, at the end of this, what is this? Can you see that? It's a flashlight. Not only do I have a radio, I have a flashlight. I can crank it. I can even charge a phone. Now, how many of you have had that one bar left on your cell phone? Just one bar. Or you just say, I just need to make one call. That's all I need, just one call. That's what this weather radio can help you with. 
because this will give you about five minutes. I mean, you can't sit there and listen, you know, to music on your phone and all that, but you can get that extra charge that you need from this. And you can hook up an Android or an iOS phone to this and charge that. So weather radios come in all shapes and sizes. I'm going to pass these around. This one, about $10. They're nice, they're compact, you can add them to your kits. There's even this smaller one. My teenagers, I give them this smaller one and they have this one. So everyone in our house, when the power goes out, especially during the winter, we all have a little something. And you can see the flashlights on the end of those as well. So, what about this one? How many of you ever seen this before? This is a lifelike. And I love, love, love this one. And I give these as gifts to my family every year. All I have to do is crank my flashlight. This is a flashlight. Not only is it a flashlight, what's this on the end? My seat belt cutter. On the other end, my windshield breaker. How's that? And guess what else I have? I must show you. It also can charge a phone for a hot second. <laughs> Remember how I said it only takes a minute? You see that right there, the port? It's called a life light. This is amazing, and I'm gonna pass this around. Now I will tell you, with Red Cross, we want you to get a kit, but you don't have to buy all of this stuff from the Red Cross. I'm not even gonna try and tell you that. What I will say is that you can go out on Amazon Amazon Prime and any of you who enjoy shopping online, they have all of this stuff. We just want you to be prepared. We don't care where you get it from, okay? Wherever you find it the cheapest, that's where we want you to get it. So we, we want you to make a kit and not just one kit. We want you to be prepared for any type of emergency. Now that life light, the life light not only is, is it a flashlight, if you turn it upside down, it's a beacon light. It's a red light that flashes. So that's excellent for the car, it's excellent for at home. I keep that everywhere. Now, what about this? How many of you heard of the Blackout Buddies? Blackout Buddy. Blackout Buddy, this little flashlight, you can plug this into your outlets in your home around your house, and they're like night lights. You know, in the evening time, it lights up, and then when it's daylight, it goes off. What's good about this, if you have an emergency, you have these little blackout buddies plugged, uh, charged around your house in your sockets. All you have to do is grab one of these and they're a flashlight. And they stay charged. So I'm going to send this around. Not only that, you have these little ones. These are for your purse, your backpack, your wallet. These, they only take one ounce of water. That's how it charges, one ounce of water. Pretty cool, right? I'll pass that around as well. So there's so many options. How many of you have heard about the Blackout Buddy before? Anyone? Okay, so the next one I pass around, you gotta say, ooh, ah, and let me know I'm there, okay? <laughs> Just let me know you're with me. You're a hard crowd. Um, um, what about this square right here? What is that? It's a map. You say it's a map, the kids say, I don't know, what is it? Oh, we use it in geography. <laughs> And when I say, what is this? Oh, wow, you have one. It's a map, kids. It's a map. You know why they do that? Because now we have GPS. We have technology. Not many people go out and buy maps. How many of you have maps? That's wonderful. Because I tell you, um, when the power goes out, or depending on what area you're in, sometimes you'll lose that GPS system. I know, been there, done that, riding down the street and my GPS goes out and I have to pull over to the side of the road and say I'm lost. So these maps, and as you can see, this is a well-worn map here, okay? I keep these in my vehicle. Prince George's County and Montgomery County, these are the two counties that I manage for Red Cross. So I keep these because you never know when you're not going to have GPS. Yes, ma'am. There are times when I have gotten far enough away from the towers yeah, the GPS does not work. Absolutely. Did you all hear that? And I can tell you a story. Can I tell you a story? I love telling stories. Um, so I had one incident. I was going into D.C. 
because it was, uh, it was probably around um, winter time because it was cold and it was wet and there was snow and there was some apartment building that was displaced. And so we were opening up a shelter in D.C. So the shelter in D.C. was um, at the new Costco. You all know what I'm talking about, the new Costco? Well, it's not new, but it's been there like three years and we still say the new Costco. But um, it's going into D.C. And so they kept telling me that it was there. I couldn't get the signal on my GPS to work. I kept riding around in circles, right? I couldn't figure it out. It was like two something in the morning because it was so much snow. And I remember my husband calling me and he said, what are you doing? He has a tracker on my phone because sometimes he wakes up, I'm not there. And I don't mind because I want somebody to have a good head start if I you know, come up missing. But anyway, he, he had the tracker and he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm trying to find this place. He said, it's right there. And I said, I don't see right there. The snow was covering the signs, folks. It was covering the signs. But if I had a map of that area, I could have found it easily because I was in the right place. It was sitting right there, but the snow was blocking the signs, so I didn't know what it was. So I will tell you, these maps come in. We had another emergency where we were directing traffic. And when I say we, I'm talking about the CERT. Um, community emergency response teams, they were directing, directing traffic and they told this one lady that you cannot go through that water. It's That standing water is really deep, it's not safe, you can't go through. And she was screaming at him and she said, I've lived here for 30 years, what do you mean I can't go through there? This is the only way I know home. That's a problem folks, if you only have one way that you know how to get home. So these maps will definitely come in. Yes ma'am. Uh, Sir. Many people have confidence at uh, Amazon. Could you set up a special section, say that's uh, Red Cross re uh, recommended at Amazon so we can buy more readily there? Well, I can't recommend Amazon. That's just a suggestion. But what I did do, and I, I share this all the time, I have these copies. Everything that, I, pretty much everything that I've been showing you, I always keep the labels. And then I make copies of them. And I can send them to Emily and I can say, these are the products that I was talking about and it'll make it a little bit easier when you go to search for it online. Would that work? Because Amazon should pay me for telling about their products. I'm just saying. <laughs> but um, the light that I was just referring to, I even have the light in here. So I keep the boxes and I'll make copies and I'll send it to you so you know which ones, if that's what you like. Um, so I have a lot of good stuff on the table. What is this? Oh, you heard me, huh? And the reason why I say this that, would you, do you think you need this in an emergency kit? I think so. I carry this around in my purse. I have a whistle in my purse. I have one in my backpack. And the reason why I have this, I probably can't scream or talk loud enough, but I can't blow a whistle. And I will tell you, my daughter who's 16, she has a whistle. She has to get off the bus. She rides the bus to school when she comes home. I tell her, that's your emergency scream if something should happen, right? So if you, I would highly recommend you have something like that in your kit. But there's so much stuff in here. Um, don't forget the paper. It's toilet paper, folks. I have an emergency stash because you never know. I'm a germaphobic. I have uh, Clorox wipes in my kit. Remember, anything that you think you may need or make yourself a little bit more comfortable in an emergency, consider packing that. Now, I have other, um, other slides that I'm going to share with Emily so she can share it with you all because our presentation is ending, but I did want to tell you one thing. I want to say this to you. How many of you own your home? How many of you have, have paid off your home? Now, those folks who have your hands up, how many of you have renter's insurance? Yeah. Condo, insurance. Condo insurance. Now, let me ask you a question. Is that for your personal items or is that for the property? Very important. And the reason why I'm sharing this with you, remember those folks that I was talking about in Suitland, Maryland? A lot of them thought they had personal insurance. They had property insurance. They was paying a couple dollars, about $10 extra every month. So when we showed up and we were telling people, call your insurance company, and they were calling and they said, I don't have insurance. They had property insurance, not personal insurance. So that's very, that was a very painful process for a lot of people. We highly encourage that you get personal insurance, renter's insurance. It'll probably cost you about $100 to $200 a year. And the reason why I say this is because when you need those personal items or items in your unit that you don't have access to, remember the folks who left and they couldn't go back for another 90 days? 
And if they had insurance, all that stuff would be covered. So you need to make sure that you have that. We have a copy on the back table there for Maryland. The state of Maryland recommends the renter's insurance and it has a, um, a description of renter's insurance. Make sure you grab one of those, okay? See, I can shut off real quick. I learned. <laughs> yes, ma'am, I'm sorry. You know, you show so many items here that it could be almost overwhelming for some seniors. Is there a possibility that you could have whatever, uh, a lot of the things that are really essential all in one pack so they could buy it that way instead of going through all of that? Yes, ma'am. If my colleague at the table or, or stand up and show you that packet, can you, Norma, can you show her that plastic bag? So in this bag, we have emergency kit items right there in the bag. And it's a simple list that you can um, take a look at. All of you are going to receive one of those bags. And it says seniors by seniors, preparedness. And it has some of the items we were talking about and stuff that's more pertinent to yourselves, OK? Remember. And thank you. Sure. We're going to move forward. Uh, Candace, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Exactly what we want from you, but we want to hear your questions during the sessions so that we can stay on schedule because our other team is right there waiting to talk to you. And we're so happy to have with us two retired battalion chiefs who are going to talk with you now about hazards of clutter. And clutter ends up being both a health hazard as well as, as, as an emergency uh, problem. But when you're trying to uh, uh, have uh, safety in your homes as well as access to your homes. So it is a very serious problem. And we have two individual experts that are going to talk to you from different aspects of, of clutter. And so we have Dee uh, Richards, who was our battalion chief at Station 25. She is, has now been promoted, and now she is, in, is responsible now for dispatching 9-11 emergency calls. And we also have David Bouchard, who has, has more than 30 years of uh, service, and, and he is now an inspector. Uh, and we're going to have them uh, play tag team. So can you welcome our tag team on Clutter? So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, David and I come to you from a fire rescue perspective. Um, as was shared with you earlier, I was the battalion chief uh, assigned right out here, right outside the Leisure World Gate for a bunch of years. I was a firefighter there. My parents live here in Leisure World, so I have a lot of really good ties to Leisure World. But uh, some of the things that Candace talked about, I really want to emphasize to you or re-emphasize to you when it comes to being prepared in, emergency, in an emergency. So um, again, from a fire rescue perspective, uh, David is a uh, retired battalion chief from Prince George's County. We do a lot of uh, operating with Prince George's County. And we, in his job and in my job, we see it a lot. You all know that there have been some pretty significant fires here in Leisure World where people have had to leave their homes immediately and weren't necessarily prepared. So what Candace is talking about and being ready and planning for those uh, emergencies is a, is a big deal. I um, want to reemphasize what Candace talked about when it comes to if you're renting your home, having renter's insurance, because the leisure world may be responsible for the property but Leisure World isn't necessarily responsible for the stuff, for your stuff. Uh, if you've owned your home, or if you've already paid off your home, also important, if you're no longer paying uh, a, or, for a, or giving a mortgage, you still, somebody still needs to be responsible for your stuff. So it's important that you understand, ask questions, ask Candace, and prepare for those type of things. Uh, when firefighters come to your home in an emergency, and it may not necessarily be a fire. There may be uh, water damage, maybe broken pipes or things like that. Our primary responsibility when we get to your house is to take care of life and property. 
Uh, we will, to the best of our ability, help you get your stuff, as much stuff as possible. But that's not our primary responsibility, particularly if we're dealing with multiple residents. So if we're in a high rise or if we're in a large building and there are multiple people who have multiple emergencies, um, it is important for you to understand there may be a period of time when we're asking you to take care of yourself. And so being prepared is very, very important. Uh, another thing I want to bring to your attention is uh, in, when there's a natural disaster, right? If there's a whole bunch of snow on the ground, uh, if there is a windstorm, if there is extreme heat, if there, uh, for some reason, there is, you know, PEPCO has a problem and there is no electricity. Remember, please, that Leisure World may not be the only community affected. If a tornado comes through and affects the Kensington Silver Spring area, Leisure World may not be the only place affected. And we may be trying to take care of multiple people and multiple emergencies. So once again, we ask that you follow Candace's, uh, you know, her recommendations and that you be prepared at least for a period of time to take care of yourself. Did you want to add anything to that? Um, so, uh, one of the things we want to talk to you all about here, uh, one of the things that concerns the fire department, and then I bring my tag team partner who, former firefighter, now uh, is in uh, code enforcement. One of the things I'd like to bring to your attention and talk about is hoarding. Uh, here in a minute, I'll have some pictures up for you to show you what hoarding looks like. But bottom line is hoarding is people keeping too much stuff. Right, too much stuff in a in, in their home, and um, oh, <laughs> sorry, I did that. Was that buzzing? So, too much stuff um, um, in your home. Too much stuff cluttering up your um, hallways. Too many things around heaters. Too many things around dryer vents. Just too much stuff. And keep in mind that too much stuff can stop us from getting to you in a timely manner. If we have to travel down narrow hallways, if you call for an ambulance, if you fall and hurt yourself, or if there's a fire in your home, trying to get to you may be very, very difficult. We want to get to you in a timely, in a timely manner. We want to provide you with help and with service. But if we can't get our cot down your hallway, if we can only fit two firefighters in a room at one time, if there's a lot of stuff and we can't find the fire, that may be a danger to you. That also may be a danger to neighbors, people who live in surrounding houses. So a lot of times people, when, when, when uh, people are aware, not just here in Leisure World, but overall, when people are aware of their neighbors having a lot of stuff, a lot of times they call the fire department and say, hey, that guy over there has a lot of stuff and I'm afraid for my own safety. And just to be clear, the fire department is not, we don't have any authority to make somebody clean up their stuff. So then they say, well, call the housing department or call code enforcement. So. There's a lot, we get to a scene of an emergency, there's a lot of stuff, so I'll call David, I'll say, David, I'm here in a place, and these people have a lot of stuff. Can't get in, can't get out, this is an apartment building, and he's gonna ask me, do they own or do they rent? If they own the home, unfortunately, he doesn't have much enforcement power either. There is no law that says a person can't have as much stuff as they want in their home. If they rent, then we may have a little bit more leeway when it comes to talking to the housing department and things like that. We may have some more leeway to contact housing and maybe uh, have some, some room there. I'll let, and then so, since David is the expert with the kind of, I'm going to push that over to him. Okay. You want to do that? So hello, uh, thanks for having me. My, my name is Dave. Hi, Dave. Um, so the hoarding, we, we get a lot of phone calls, as you can imagine, and, and like the, the chief says, there's nothing we can do about hoarding. Um, 
what, we're, what we will do is we will attempt to educate the owner of the home or the owner of the property. Um, so speak into the mic. Sure. Okay. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So what we will try to do is educate the owner of the property. Um, we'll go out with housing sometimes, um, and with uh, one or two of us, and with the fire department, uh, and educate them on. Um, I, I can tell you that uh, most recently, uh, two weeks ago in Prince George's County, right on the district line on Eastern Avenue, there was two fire deaths. Uh, as a result of hoarding. They couldn't get out. One person was found in the living room and the, the second person was found hanging out of the second uh, floor window in the rear. And the firefighters couldn't get into the house because of the hoarding situation. And that's oftentimes what happens is we find out from EMS or from fire, uh, they'll call us and tell us they'll come and they can't get an occupant out. I can tell you that um, um, from my own experience, I worked the last several years in the Ox Greater Oxford Hill area in Prince George's County, and it was a major problem down there. These people have owned their homes for 50, 60 years, and it's their castle. And there's absolutely nothing we can do. So we would try to tell them, you know, people don't think that when they jam things into, um, say, a storage room, the storage room may also have your heating and air conditioning or your water heaters in there, and especially if they're gas fired, there's an open flame in there. And, um, and they'll often ignite and they'll, they won't even know the fire will happen during the night. Um, I've seen situations where people have been confined in one room of the house where they actually have family members that come and feed them and take care of them, but the family members don't address it. So we'll try to talk with the family members, with the, with the, with the children or the, with their spouse and tell them, uh, you know, the, the, the dangers of the boarding. But again, there's nothing we can do. Um, there, there actually was a fire in the county two years ago. Um, it was an apartment building. It, it was a pretty serious hoarding situation. We spoke to the gentleman several times, and uh, it just happened um, about three weeks after speaking with him, there was a fire in the apartment, and he passed away. So, um, you know, we see it, but, you know, we, we do have some better luck with the renting, and, I, and there's a gentleman in the back, he'll speak with you about that possibly, but in one of the breakout sessions, but um, we don't have right of entry even with the rental. So if we can get into the to the to the unit of, a, of an apartment or the home, that, then we can address it. So I think the chief has some yeah. pictures here, different stages of clutter. Can we uh Ernesto, I'm gonna need your help with this. Um can you can you all see those these pictures at all? Is it kinda of tough to see those pictures? Can you help me zoom in a little bit? Yes. Yeah, that may be an idea. Dim the lights. I don't know. I'm not sure. Okay, we'll figure it out. But I, I, I will add. I'll add one thing, and I'm guilty of, of this too. And spouses need to be accountable for their spouses. Okay. I, my wife will sometimes come to me and say, "Why are you keeping this?" And I'll say, "Well, you know, you might need it a year from now." Well, you don't need it a year from now. Or I think I might fix it. You know. And then, uh, and there's that. There's that commercial on right now about like I've become my father. Well, you know, I, I have. I've become my grandfather and my great-grandfather, too, because they kept everything. I was joking with the chief before she before this started about, I have a two-car garage, but we can only use half of it, because I have things in the other half that I might need, but I don't need them, you know. So uh, if spouses are accountable for spouses, you know, that might help if you just, you know, hold each other accountable for what you have. Do you really need it? Or when was the last time you used it? If you haven't used that item within the last year, you don't need it. Give it away to Goodwill. Hopefully you can use it as a tax write-off, maybe, or somebody else could use it. Okay, uh, picture number one. Is that hoarding? No. No. That's just, who, does somebody say yes? Is that hoarding? No. Okay, that's just stuff. You see, um, uh, there's some newspapers over here, you know, some stuff over here. For some people, that may start to bring some concern, because the question may be asked, and I apologize, the picture isn't that clear, like why do we need to keep these newspapers and those newspapers? I mean, what, what, are, we, what are we keeping for? Right, so while we say no, mm, there's some stuff on the floor, there's some more newspapers there on the sofa, so maybe, maybe we need to start to think about, eh, do we really need all these newspapers? Okay, we'll try to slide over to number two. Same room. Okay, what about now? 
It's getting worse, right? But we know people have family members. Maybe we. That's a whole bunch. For me, that's too many newspapers. I don't know what. Are we going to read them? Are we working on a project? I'm not sure what's going on. Let's look at three. Okay, what about now? So in this instance, what, what do you do? You have a conversation maybe. You say, uh, I don't know if I need this many newspapers. Start to throw some stuff away. If you went to a friend's house, a family member's house, and you were there, would you have some concerns? Or would you just say, eh, that's kind of the way they keep their stuff? Right? Uh -huh. Would you do, would you just, there's some, looks like some clothes or something there on the sofa. Does it look like a teenager's room? <laughs> right? Maybe you just move the stuff off to the side and then you sit down and you think, oh man, they need to clean this place up. Right? Let's look at picture number four. Other way. Other way. No, he's right. He's right. What about now? That's it's getting worse. worse. <laughs> it's getting worse, right? And then picture number five. Yes, problem, right? Now you would say, I hear people saying, okay, wait a second, this is hoarding. In some instances, uh, we would start to say, from my profession, going into someone's house, we would have started having some concern at picture number one. Let's look at picture number six. Okay, so we know people that live like this. We know people that live like this. I personally have been in a number of houses, uh, unfortunately on a fire, where I, couldn't, I could not walk on the floor, right? There was stuff piled up. I've been in, in, in situations that were of the concern where I was probably elevated, probably two or three feet off of the floor, so I was able to touch the ceiling because there was so much stuff on the floor, right? So you can imagine somebody trying to maneuver around and something like that. Sometimes people fall down in the stuff. They can't get out. Stuff like that happens, right? This is how it starts to look. Uh, picture number seven. He's right. Yeah, he's right. Right? People live like this. It's their stuff. They don't want to get rid of it. Unfortunately, some of the residents here and Leisure World live like this. Then picture number eight. Oh, come on. You, you could not get in or out. I could not get in or out. And you have to imagine if somebody were to be sick inside this apartment <laughs> or if um, there was a fire there, I couldn't find the seat of the fire. We couldn't find, we don't know where the fire is. It's somewhere. You know, and, and, no, you're right. And then getting water to the seat of the fire, right? So the water would have to penetrate uh, down through this kind of stuff, all through. And then the final picture is picture number nine. And th this isn't made up. We see this. We see this. And so people live like this. Big concern. Remember, we can't get in. The folks can't get out. If we need to take an ambulance in, or take a stretcher in there, you know, find the seat of a fire, which is important to get to the seat of the fire to put it out. Uh, you would imagine even if that something over there is on fire and we just spray a bunch of water, how long will it take for the water to seep down? Um, so we, fire department, code enforcement, would really encourage people to start paying attention at picture number one. Because from our perspective, Let's go back to picture number one. There's no reason to have that many newspapers. What, what, what's the plan with them, right? And at some point, it goes from picture number one to two, and then it gets overwhelming, right? And you can't do anything about it. We've seen instances both from uh, my seat and from <coughs> Dave's seat where people had to move. They live in an apartment, and the weight on the floor becomes so heavy until, you know, we're uh, concerned about structural collapse. Uh, in newer construction, you know, they just don't build stuff the way they used to. 
in um, newer construction as opposed to some of the older solid wood brick construction, a room can't hold all this stuff. So now you put water on that because there's a fire. You put water on that plus some firefighters that love to eat. You put them in, in, inside there and we have, we're in danger of a structural collapse. So now you ask yourself, that's my neighbor's house. What do we do about it? And the, and the, 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 what we, what I'm here to tell you is that even if it looks like this, I can, and the, and the person owns the home, I can make a request, I can offer suggestions, but unfortunately, I'm not enforcement. And there's not much from a, 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 a I see your hand, not much from a, a enforcement perspective that I can do. So I would call Dave. Dave would come out and say, do they own or do they rent? I would say, mm, we believe they own. And then we would try to get some social workers involved, but that's a, that's a, that's a process, right? And I saw somebody's hand. Yes, ma'am. So there is some correlation between some, uh, some mental illness and hoarding, but then that's why we would call in the social workers, right? So I may deal with that person on an emergency basis, but I am not qualified to say that this person is mentally ill, right? So we would bring in the social workers, we try to do some housing stuff, I call code enforcement, we try to work with that person to do something about this. I, I do have one thing. So the unfortunate reality of number nine or any of this is um, as a chief officer, when I was a chief officer, I also had to think about my personnel, the men and women that were the firefighters. Imagine that storage room I told you about with that small pilot light that now lights a fire. It's rapid fire spread. Usually by the time you get the 911 call, dispatch, and arrival time, you're talking maybe six minutes to nine minutes. At that point, the house is usually well off or fully involved. As a chief officer, we would not go in. So we would make a decision that if anyone was even in that home, they were most likely had already passed away before our arrival, and I wasn't going to risk the lives of my personnel to go in. And that's the unfortunate reality, and that's what, the, the, as a chief officer, you know, you, you, you face those situations. And it's become, because of litigation in, in today's world, more and more chief officers now will make the decision not to go in if they arrive, even if they know there may be one or two people in there, because that house is so well involved. You know, it, the ends don't it justify the means. So it's just they, that, that's that's the reality of it. So, like like just to reiterate what the chief said at the first slide, throw those newspapers out. You know, and sometimes it may not even hurt just to pick them up and throw them out. People may not may not even notice that you're doing it. You know, but check on your neighbors and check on your loved ones. That's the biggest thing you can do. Is it very often people who drink a lot since you're showing? I, I, I assume it's Peter. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's just, that just happened to be I in that picture. I think that just, just, just happens to be in the picture. I, I've actually been to homes like this on EMS calls and met some very nice people. You know, and they, it's just an illness. Yeah, really, and they just don't realize how bad it is themselves sometimes because they've become used to it. And all those things are important to them, believe it or not. We see some people doing it with animals, right? They're keeping up, they keep, we see people doing it with animals as well, with cats, with dogs, birds. I saw a hand over here somewhere. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I live in a high rise here in Eastern World. Yes, ma'am. Um, I would recommend working with your HOA to get that enforced. HOA, what is that? The condo, oh. the condo association. Okay, the condo association. Or the homeowner association. I understood it had something to do when they mentioned it one time with the laws in Maryland. 
Well, I think it's, it's probably the laws anywhere. He, he can help with that question. Hi, uh, Robert Goff from Department of Housing Code Enforcement. Please use the mic. Can you go? My name is Robert Goff. I'm with Department of Housing Code Enforcement. Um, if we get a call for hoarding in a high rise, we can ask management to let the tenants know or the owner know that we, we need to get in. If they have somebody who has witnessed it, the HOA or whoever who it is here, it's in their bylaws that they have to protect the property and their neighbors. So we can't get a search warrant to go in if the owners won't let us in. Yeah, so that's the big problem. So if they won't let you in, we've got a danger that we're living with. So now what? We could get a search warrant to go in. Oh, you can? Okay. Yes, we have done that. Okay. What is the process for doing that? Uh, we just write it up, take it over to the county attorney, and we'll go have a judge sign it. Okay. Yes? I'm here in Leisure World. If you suspect hoarding, you can call the social worker and they can manage. If they can't get in, at least they'll call you. Yes. Speaking of which. I think we have some, I think we have some social workers here. Next on the program. Next, right? on, next on the program. Next on the program. So as you're as as we're learning, it's not an easy process, right? Just because I show up or just because code enforcement shows up, we can't fix it overnight. It involves fire department, somebody that's how we're usually that's how we usually find out about it. Generally these people uh, won't let anybody in, not even their family members. Uh, they're very private. Um, they may work outside the home, go outside, they may dress immaculately. So there would not be any outward signs that these folks live like this. But a lot of times they won't let you in. If you knock on the door, they'll come out, talk to you. There are a variety of things. And so it's not an easy, quick process. So a lot of times there'll be an illness or some type of emergency in the home. Fire department gets there either because of a fire or a smoke scare or something like that. We'll get in the home, we'll realize that there's a problem. We'll call code enforcement. Code enforcement will call housing. Housing will get in touch with social, work, social workers. So you can see, and then they try to work with the person and try to, you know, be somewhat delicate about where they are. And so it's not an easy process. We certainly understand the concerns. You know, what do we do if our neighbor is living like this? But it's not an easy step process. I think, and I think we do have, we, we do have some folks that represent social work here. Yes, and we're going to kind of form a team. Right. That's what we're going to do right now. Yes, ma'am. Would the health department ever become involved because of mold or? Yes. Yeah. Not, that'd be after us. I have no idea. Us? We. Do they have any influence in you? So we're going to have these breakouts where they can okay. answer all the questions they want. I gotcha. So we need to. Okay, we need to move forward. Move okay, I've been told to get off the stage. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you weren't. we're going to have these breakout sessions where you can ask all the questions you want. Um, so um, now I'm, I'm Sandra McCluskey. I'm the chair of the Health Advisory Committee. And um, I'm here to introduce Susan Montgomery and Sandy Hart. Susan is the director of our social service department at Leisure World. And Sandy is one of the um, uh, social workers. And also we have um, Donald, Donna Heichelberger, who is a, um, a person who owns a company, Graceful Transitions, who helps people um, in transitions, including uh, clutter. And so they're going to um, give a presentation, and then we're going to have refreshments and breakout, assemble in our breakout sessions, and that's when we can have individual discussions with these people and ask all the questions we want. So now I'm going to turn it over to Susan and Sandy and Donna. Yes. Good afternoon. I'm feeling a little bit of pressure now. Everyone's <laughs> waiting to hear what the social workers have to say. Uh, my name is Susan Montgomery, and I am the Director of Social Services here at Leisure World. Uh, I want to just start by telling you a little bit about our department because I really do feel like we are one of the best kept secrets around here. 
The social work department is made up of four very experienced licensed clinical social workers, two full-time and two part-time. I'm full-time, Sandy is part-time. And we're located in the MedStar Medical Center and our services are free to all of the residents of Leisure World. In general, our job is to help residents maintain safe and independent living. And when challenges arise, the social workers will provide help in meeting the residents' needs. One of the great things is that because we're not restricted by HIPAA or insurance companies or medical companies, we are able to provide ongoing assistance to address medical, financial, and psychosocial needs. So that's just a little bit about the department. Um, but I'm here today to talk very briefly about our role when it comes to helping our residents with clutter. What we do know is that clutter can significantly interfere with a person's ability to safely function in their environment. And over time, it really can affect your overall health and well-being. Clutter can cause health threats. We've heard a little bit about that today, um, including <coughs> fires, falls, um, worsening allergies, breathing problems, and unsanitary living conditions. Suffering from environmental effects of mold. Talk into the mic, please. Suffering from the unsanitary uh, living conditions, um, uh, environmental conditions like mold, mildew, and dust, and in some cases, rodent and insects, and it can be quite debilitating. Clutter can also cause people to be embarrassed and socially isolated. And actually, the case study that we're going to present today really shares a little bit about how things can get very, very out of control when someone's dealing with shame and embarrassment. Overlooked mail, lost bills, utilities being turned off for non-payment, and missing medications. These are some of the things that we have personally experienced here at Leisure World with some of our residents. So it really does show you there's so many things that can happen that we need to be aware of. So the social workers can be called in really by anybody. We, we get calls from family, from friends, from neighbors, doctors, clergy, and other social work staff. And sometimes we get calls from the residents themselves. Just so that you guys know, if you are concerned about someone and you call us, any information you tell us and your names would be kept confidential. So when we get a call about a resident, one of the very first things we do is to reach out to the resident and work towards establishing a relationship so that the resident is comfortable. We let them know we're there to advocate for them and we're there to help them to, to stay safe and independent. For some of our residents, I think just having somebody reach out to them can be a real difference maker and making sure they know they're not alone, that we're not there to make any judgments about them or the way they live. Um, and that I think that's extremely important. Once we've established the relationship, if the resident is open to it, we make plans to do a home visit. Of course, not everybody really is open to having the social workers come in to do home visits. But we think that home visits can be really helpful so our residents can see us and see that we're uh, non-threatening and hopefully there to help them. One of the goals of the home visit is to get a sense of what the resident is dealing with. Once we have an idea of what they're dealing with, it's much easier to come up with a plan. And it doesn't do us any good to come up with a plan if a resident is not fully on board. So identifying a plan to go forward with the resident is extremely important. When we're identifying the plan, one of the very first things we do is to try to identify who will be available to help with that plan. Sometimes that means the social worker, the resident, it could mean a neighbor, it could mean a family. So we want to identify who is responsible, um, who, who is going to be involved, and then what responsibilities each of those people will have. It could also mean identifying resources within the community that would be helpful, including companies that can help with decluttering, like Graceful Transitions. And 
Plans can also include connecting residents with physicians and other health care professionals to address any of the health issues that may come up as a result of the clutter and hoarding. So these are just some of the ways that the Leisure World social workers can help. As I said before, our goal is to work with the residents to find manageable solutions that they are comfortable with so they can stay safe and independent. So um, now Sandy Hart is going to talk to you a little bit about, share a story with you about uh, one of the residents that we've worked with here in Leisure World. And we won't use any names. Good. I will be sharing a case study with you and I will be, I will call the resident Mrs. B. PPD was called in by Mrs. B for a water leak. When they arrived, they found that the home had a lot of clutter, which they felt posed a health danger. PPD alerted the social services department that a resident may need some help. I reached out to the resident to tell her about our services and how we might be able to help. During the process of developing a relationship of trust, explaining that I was there as her advocate in several calls, Mrs. B finally agreed for me to come out for a home visit. As I entered the home, there were stacks of newspapers, mail, broken equipment, old food boxes throughout the home with an identifiable path. I was unable to find a place to sit. I found out that Mrs. B was very embarrassed by her home situation and had become more and more isolated from her family because of this. Throughout our discussions, Mrs. B was able to identify family members who she felt comfortable with notifying and thus asking for their help. We called these family members together and invited them to a meeting to discuss the clutter situation. The family had a feeling that something was wrong because of their relationship had changed. And when Mrs. B did agree to see them, she always insisted that they pick her up in the lobby. We were able to have a family meeting together and we were able to develop, develop a concrete plan which included the assistance from her family and utilizing a declutter resource. Then Mrs. B's home was eventually able to be cleaned. Going forward, the family agreed to continue to be a support for Mrs. B. And, and we also, we have some resources on the back table to include some people that can help and some services, mm -hmm. like graceful transitions. Thanks. Well, happy spring. We're only three weeks behind, right? <laughs> I bring this up because usually it's springtime that people start thinking about decluttering. Anybody out here got any projects going on right now? A few of you, great. Me too, me too. I remember uh, growing up in my house with my mom, usually around the first day of spring, we would, you know, roll up the carpets, any of you do any of that, and take down the heavy drapes and make sure the shears look good and things would go out to the dry cleaners. What were some of the... His, your experiences growing up when when I was very little, we had those heavy, heavy curtains. Yes. So you took them down and you put up what years? Years. Years. Yeah, so the shears, right, the shears come up, the heavy drapes come down. Yeah. Uh huh. Um, I don't know whether other people know this or not, but if you do have books that you don't want to throw out, you think they're of some value or whatever. Uh, the Friends of the Library would appreciate your call, and they can send out a truck to pick up the books that you don't want. And so at the Friends of the Library Used Bookstore, thereby helping support their programs. Okay, well that's a good resource. All right, thank you. Thanks for sharing. So while a young man's fancy typically turns to love in the springtime, a seasoned people really get excited about decluttering. <laughs> I know that I do. I do. So I thought we, had, we could have a little bit of fun. I don't know how much time I have with this. 15 minutes. Okay, I thought we would right now in our seats declutter. What do you think about that? So we're going to use a little bit of imagery, all okay? right? I want you to think about your space, the entire space that you have in your apartment, your condo, your home, okay? 
I want you to pick a room. You got a room in mind? A room that you might want to address, maybe declutter. All right, so you've got that. Anyone want to share a particular room that's coming to mind? A spare bedroom. A spare bedroom. And it's interesting you say spare because usually I uh, highly recommend you start in a room that you don't hang out in frequently. Okay, so spare bedroom. All right. So what are we going to have to do to help you declutter that spare bedroom? I would suggest that you come up with some goals. What would, why don't we take your spare bedroom? Did anybody else pick a spare bedroom or a spare room or you had other areas in your home you were thinking about? Balcony. Oh, the balcony. Interesting. Okay, so whether it's the spare bedroom or the balcony, you need to come up with a list of goals to, you know, tackle your project, right? So what can we do uh, in the way of tackling the spare bedroom or the balcony? What are some of the goals? So the goal is certainly what, to clean it out or is it just to address some of the furniture in the room or what, what are you thinking about with the spare bedroom? Is it a mattress you want to get rid of or? Is she going to decide what to get, she wants it to be at the end or what she wants to get rid of to get to the end? Is it best? Or to think that way. Okay, so you, you really, I, I presume you want to kind of pare it down in the room. Is that why you're suggesting you well, want to tackle the spare bedroom? There's stacks of things. There's stacks of things. Okay, so so one of your goals is going to be getting rid of the stacks that are in the spare bedroom, and maybe on your balcony. What are some of the goals that are you just wanted to have it look nicer? Get rid of some stuff. Do you want it to be more accessible? So be thinking along those terms. Yeah, I definitely want it to be much more accessible okay. because I have too much stuff on it. Okay, too much stuff. So really when we're looking at these rooms, we really feel like we may have too much stuff in those rooms. So we've got our goal of paring down. And what are some of the things then that we're going to have to do to start paring that down? Many of us would start with a phone call maybe to one of our kids, family members to say, hey, is there anything in this room or in the balcony that you might be interested in? Have any of you picked up the phone and called a family member to say, are you interested in my china? Are you interested in my silver? Most responses are, I'm not interested, you know? And that really breaks our heart many times because some of the stuff that we have is heirloom pieces or treasures that we've held on to for so long and it is our hope that our loved ones will consider taking it, but many times they don't. But that would be a good place to start. Have any of you done that? Have any of you picked up the phone and called? You have. With regard to the balcony or in general? In general. And what was the response? Well, like a marvelous boat set that's 50 years old. This boat's beautiful. And so were they interested, the family? Not in the least. <laughs> and that's a typical. Nowadays, they have different kinds of tastes. They yeah, like paper plates. That's right. <laughs> Many times they don't want the china, they don't no, want the silver so because they don't want to clean it and they don't want the beautiful crystal and I'm always selling this stuff. So if your loved one says forget it, I would suggest your next step would be try to sell it. Have any of you tried to sell anything? There are many ways to sell things. Well, tell us about those. I will. I will. <laughs> So one way is auction. Anybody know of any good auctioneers? I can certainly maybe in the breakout sessions recommend some auctioneers that you can talk to. They actually will come to your house at no charge and they'll take a walk around and they'll be able to identify those things for sale. So they cherry pick, but at least you might be able to get a few bucks for some things, okay? All right, so that's one. How about charity? We, someone mentioned over here about books. Many of you have probably, I know one right very close by we love is a wider circle. Many of you are familiar. And the person here with the spare bedroom, if you want to get rid of a mattress, do you know a wider circle is the only charity that I'm aware of that will take mattresses and box springs? They sanitize them and they fly out the window. The need is so great. Yeah. So charities would be another. Let me back up because I talked about auction, but there's also, you can work with consignment, you can work online, you know, eBay is an online auction. So I can tell you about all these ways in which you can sell things. And I've got information in the back, call me and I can talk to you about maybe an estate sale. Although keep in mind the rule of thumb is you want to have at least $5,000 worth of stuff in your house to sell for an estate sale person to make it worth their while. So that's just a rule of thumb. And then lastly, there are liquidators. 
You won't get as much if you liquidate things, which means you get cash in hand, which is wonderful, but you'll probably get less from a liquidator than you may get if it goes to auction or if it goes to consignment. I right, so have the names of the liquidators. I do have some names. So maybe, you know, one on one, I'm happy to share that information with you for liquidation. Okay. So you have family, you have selling, there's certainly charity. And I know we try to repurpose everything, but on occasion, we do have to send things to the transfer station or to the dump, sadly, especially when I'm in houses. I'm in attics, basements, garages, and we do find ourselves going to the landfills sometimes. So, so you've got all, all this help. Now, you have to identify your resources, too. For example, Montgomery County is very good with bulk pickup. Now, I'm not quite sure about this community. Do you have any idea about this community? Do they do bulk pickup here? Don't know. Okay. Because I'm in a lot of communities outside of this active adult community where you can line up all of your... Um, rubbish basically. I, uh, a couple years ago we lined up 85 bags, contractor bags, that went to the to the curbside and we made a phone call to understand the policies and procedures with Montgomery County and they came and they took it all away. You pay um, a, a nice sum in taxes and so this is one of the benefits that you get. So there can be something called bulk pickup. All right, so how else do you see your project kind of moving along? So, so you've got the stuff on the balcony, right? And family isn't interested. Would you feel comfortable, um, you know, thinking about sending things to charity? Would you know who to bring in to help you I, take that I'm stuff away? I'm quite a bit to charity. Okay, good. But I still have lots, and if you're the person who buys, fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't buy. I don't buy. But um, I do, as I shared with you, I'm happy to share those resources with okay. you. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Anybody else have projects? That, I mean, what are, were some of the other rooms that came to mind when I said, just imagine, you know, we're decluttering right now. You know, what are, you know, give me, anybody in the kitchen? Was anybody finding themselves in the kitchen? How many of you continue to bake? Do you, do you ask yourselves those questions? Well, I don't think I'll be baking anymore, so should I hold on to my bakeware? I know I have a spring form pan that I haven't used in 35 years. I still have held on to it. You never know what I'm gonna make that cheesecake, but I do ask myself those questions too. So are you continuing to bake? If you've kind of backed off on the baking, maybe you should think about you know, giving away some of that nice bakeware that you have. Do you really need seven frying pans? Maybe you just need the 10 inch and the eight inch, and maybe you don't need that grand you know, 12 inch frying pan anymore. So look at it that way. How about bread makers? Things that stay in you know, the cabinets that really don't come out anymore. Those, those appliances, those small appliances, heavy mixers, are you still you know, baking those cookies? So kind of look at it that way. How about your closets? How's that coming along? Oh, Anybody have issues with closets? Oh, oh, that's May, mostly women. I'm sorry, ladies, we do. I worked with a client once. She had sizes 8 through size 22. And we had to call California closets because she would not get rid of anything in the closet. So I was happy to accommodate her. She was a size 12 when I met her. I didn't think she'd ever get back down to a size 8 or upwards of a size 22. But it was very important to her past, and that's why she held on to 150 dresses, which was, you know, fine. So we, we spent $3,000 to bring in California closets, but they did get the job done. So I would just suggest to you, you might feel a little bit freer if you can get in your closet and maybe start paring down. Do you have anything that still has a price tag on it? If so, I doubt that you're ever gonna wear it. <laughs> Usually they say if you hold on to something for a year or two and you haven't worn it, chances are you never will wear it. And shoes, ladies, that's another, I think, real challenge for us. Uh, anybody still has spectator, what are they called, spectator shoes oh, or yeah, something? They're, they're beautiful, the yeah. two-tone but they're kind of out of style. So really kind of look at your wardrobe in that sort of way. Is it still in style? Does it still fit? Still comfortable to you? How about papers? Papers have a tendency to pile up, don't they? Do you have that in your spare bedroom, papers? No, I, in my home office. In your home office? Oh, so now we're in the home office and we do have papers. It's not unusual for me to go into a home with 50 to 60 years worth of papers. And many times people really aren't sure what's important to keep. 
Um, so I would encourage you to talk to maybe your accountant or an attorney or even go online if you feel comfortable and do a little bit of searching because it will outline for you what's important to keep. You know, maybe some of those tax forms, maybe if you had renovation work done, you know, in your apartment or your condo, you might want to hold on to that in case at some point you sell. So there are some papers you want to hold on to. Uh, many times I find that papers you have important papers and then you have junk mail and I find that the junk mail and the important papers are all together. Uh, it's not uncommon for me to find naturalization papers in with the junk mail, oh, social security cards, <laughs> and many times I find uncashed checks from the IRS and they will honor it. There was one that I found recently, it was 10 years old and the government did honor it. It was for like $15,000 and they did honor it, they cashed it. How about old photos? Old photos is another one because here again, family isn't necessarily interested in those old photos. They might want a few, but not all of them. And slides, many of us have slides and they start to deteriorate after 30 or 40 years. They become discolored, the discoloration. Um, I, I hear a lot of people say, I'm going to put them on DVD, but I would suggest you only do that if your family is interested because it can be very time consuming or costly to put these lovely photos on a DVD. Maybe what you do is you go out to like a TJ Maxx or you know these home good places where you can get those lovely sturdy boxes. It's like a cigar box but they're very attractive and then you go ahead and you know maybe you put some of the photos in, pick up a couple of them for each of your kids and or nephews, nieces. I've done that with my nieces and nephews. And I have three boxes and they're getting a lot of pictures when they were growing up. So I'm doing that now actually, in my spare bedroom. <laughs> I have a repository right now of all these pictures that we're going through. So, okay, good. Yeah, please. Um, can you tell uh, how many years one is supposed to save um, tax papers? I mean, old tax and declarations and old bank papers. I'm pretty sure there's a rule of thumb. There is. Yeah, I've been told that if you're still employed, it's best to hold on to all those W-2s, or I think it's right, W-2s, because, you know, just in case those Social Security numbers come out and they don't sync up and then you have proof. But if you're retired, I don't think that you need to keep all of your income tax information. Um, I don't know the rule of thumb. I don't know if it's seven years or three years. I do have some clients that will scan the information into a little scanner and then they throw away the hard copies. But they do keep those records uh, in digital form. So that might be a consideration. But I don't, like cancel checks, they say keep at least three years. Uh, that's kind of a rule of thumb. I keep them for three years. But keep in mind the bank will have your statements available to you for at least three to five years. And many of these are archived for five to seven years. So you really can, in all honesty, go to your bank for that information. So, but do check with an account. Do you have an accountant maybe you can speak to or an attorney that might be able to guide and direct you in that regard? Okay. I think the one thing that I, I uh, really encourage my clients to do is to be proactive in tackling the, this clutter perhaps or you know, your decluttering uh, because if you don't take the time to make those decisions, somebody's going to be making them for you. You might find that you've broken a hip, you're in rehab, you cannot go back to your house. This, these are true stories. And then you're bringing in your adult children or your niece or your nephew, and sadly, maybe sometimes me trying to help make those decisions. And that's not good. If you can be very proactive and do it now, springtime is a very good place uh, to start your project. New beginnings, a lot of people like to, to start in the spring. I would encourage you to do that, to be proactive. Yeah. <coughs> Yeah, any other questions or that I can answer here? Certainly, I can talk to you more when we go to the breakout session. Um, how are we doing on time? It's time. It's time. It is time. Okay, great. All right. So we can continue the conversation a little later. Thanks. You have 15 minutes to have cookies and soda and an emergency break if you need it or... Uh, but we would really like for you to come back 
because a very important part of our program is for you to meet the experts, to get a chance to talk with those the experts, and to ask the questions that we've asked you to hold. And I want to thank you for holding your questions. I want to thank the panelists for thanks, uh, speaking to their time because they did a good job today. And can we give them another hand before you?